Hello class, the next set of reactions that we're going to look into are called pericyclic reactions. And so I'm going to introduce three different types of these pericyclic reactions. And then after I introduce those three, we will go into much depth and look at some examples. Okay, the first point that we need to understand is pericyclic reactions don't occur uh, with ionic or free radical intermediates. So what is that saying? Recall in, let's say, a, let's go to the whiteboard. Let's say we look at a SN1 mechanism. In an SN1 mechanism, what's the first step? Well, the leaving group has to leave, right? And what do we generate? <clears throat> ionic species. Okay. That does not happen in a pericyclic reaction. And then what we have also is radical intermediates, where you would have the fish hook arrows. Like, that's not a fish hook arrow, no, is it? So if we had something like this, that doesn't occur as well. Okay. So the first of the three is called a cycloaddition reaction in which you have two pieces and those two pieces join together to make one cyclic molecule. Now these arrows here, that's how the book draws them. But we could also draw them like this. Maybe this will make more sense of what's happening if I draw it like this. What, what these dotted, well, I take that back. These dotted arrows are showing the connectivity of what's going to happen. So that bond right here is that bond right there. Okay. So if we number those, the one, one, two, two. Okay, so that's how you draw the arrows to form a cycloaddition compound. We have electrocyclic reactions in which you see we go from one molecule that is not cyclic to one molecule that is cyclic. Okay. And then we have a sigmatropic rearrangement now, at first glance, you may look at this molecule here, molecule A and molecule B, and say, hey, aren't they the same thing? In this particular example, yes. But what if we number these? One, two. Okay. And we number the same way. To see now we have a bond between carbon 1 and carbon 6 where we did not before. Now, why is this a big deal? Because what if we had a substituent on carbon 3? When it undergoes a sigmatropic rearrangement, that substituent is still going to be on carbon 3. Now we have a substituent. Now, look at molecule A versus molecule B. Do you see how they are no longer the exact same molecule? They're different. All right. We have some features that we need to be aware of is that one, the reaction me mechanism is concerted, meaning these bonds breaking and forming okay, are concerted. They're happening at the same time. And when they happen at the same time, we're not going to generate any ionic or radical intermediates. Now, the mechanism of the movement of those electrons is in a ring and in a closed loop. <clears throat> the transition state is cyclic. So what that's saying is when we look at this reaction right here, where it goes this way. Okay. 
that reaction mechanism that I'm showing you right there is the first one that we looked at. Notice how I'm drawing the arrows a little bit different than the slide here. And the reason why I do that is because it's showing me the connectivity of what's happening. And so that's going to get go and give us our product that looks like that. Okay. Now the transition state is going to look like this. It's going to be cyclic. Let's let me go to the whiteboard because it's easier to draw on the whiteboard. Let's redraw this here. So these electrons come there, there, there. So that's going to give us that compound there. Now the transition state is going to look like this. There. Do you see the dotted lines? The dotted lines are the bonds that are breaking and forming. So if you just get rid of the solid bonds, do you see how the transition state is cyclic? If we just trace the dotted lines, we have a six-membered ring. So in pericyclic reactions, the transition state is cyclic. Now the polarity of the solvent generally has no effect. And why that's so important is because when we generate cations, it's, we have to choose a solvent that can uh, influence the reaction, influence it for the best or for the worst, depending on what you want to do. So you choose a solvent that interacts less with the cations or interacts with them more, depending on what you want to do. And so when we do a pericyclic reaction, it doesn't matter what type of solvent that we use. If it's a polar protic or polar aprotic solvent, it does not matter because there's no ions generated as intermediates for the solvent to interact with. So that's another uh, data point that suggests that the pericyclic reactions do not generate any intermediates. It's all concerted and happens at the same time. The first reaction that we're going to look at is called a Diels-Alder reaction, named after the two people that discovered it. Okay, And the Diels-Alder reaction is very, very important because one, it forms carbon-carbon bonds. When you find reactions that form carbon-carbon bonds, that's a good reaction, okay? Because forming carbon-carbon bonds are oftentimes difficult. And the Diels-Alder reaction can take two pieces, separate pieces, and form a six-membered ring. Okay? Diels-Alder reactions typically occur at higher temperatures and higher pressures, but that all depends on what's attached to the alkene here and what's attached to the diene. Okay? And we will get into those details a little bit later. But I'm just introducing the reaction here. So it forms a, a dills the reaction forms a six-membered ring. Okay? Now we see here that the yield is really, really low. We can increase that yield by putting a substituents on these molecules here, which we'll get to later. Okay? But it's cool. We can still get the reaction to go to form that six-membered ring. Now here's the curved arrow notation that I like to use to show the Diels-Alder reaction. Okay? 
So we, you can see it there. The pi electrons there are th used to form this bond right here. And then these pi electrons right there are used to form that bond right there. Okay. Now there's that word right there is concerted. The dills all the reaction is concerted, which means all the bonds break and form simultaneously. That's a key feature. If it did not do that, then you would have a charged intermediate somewhere. But we can't find a charged intermediate anywhere in the process of the in in the process of the reaction. So it's concerted. In order for that to happen, the six electrons that are flowing, so let's count the six electrons. Let me come back here. Pi electrons, though. We have two pi there, two pi there, and two pi. So a total of six pi electrons <clears throat> involved in this reaction. Now those six electrons are going to flow in a cyclic fashion. Okay? And I already mentioned that these reactions proceed through a cyclic transition state. And that's what makes the reaction a pericyclic reaction. Now, with the dills alder reaction, to be more specific, the cyclic movement of electrons joins two pieces together. And because it's joining two pieces together to form one ring, we call that a cycloaddition reaction, bringing them two pieces together. Another part of the um, introduction here to Dills Alder is there's a term called the diene, which we already know. Dienes look like this. All right, dienes are conjugated. Well, sorry, in Dill's Alder reactions, the diene is going to be conjugated. Okay. And then we have what's called the dienophile, and that would be the alkene. Right. And we call it the dienophile because it loves to form a bond with the diene. Doesn't the words make sense? Isn't that cool? So gotta remember that. Dienophile, or sorry, diene, dienophile. Okay. okay. Now, the dills alder reaction can also be described as a 4 plus 2 cycloaddition reaction. Now, this 4 plus 2 right here is just telling us how many pi electrons are involved in the reaction. So, in a dills alder reaction right here, okay, how many electrons are involved in the reaction? Well, we have 2. Four. So four pi electrons in the diene, and then we have two pi electrons in the dienophile. So that's where you see the four plus two in brackets cycloaddition. That's where that nomenclature is coming from. A Dills-Alder reaction can also take place with an alkyne. The alkyne is still called a dienophile. Because what, what's happening here, look at it mechanistically here, pi electrons come to form that bond, pi electrons come there, and then those break and go there. So you can see based off of the color code where all the pieces are coming from, in this cyclo product or cyclic product.
Now, the cyclic transition state that I've been talking about and which is so important has a term called an, it can be an aromatic transition state. And in order to understand an aromatic transition state, we need to understand Huckel's rules. So the next video that we're going to, I'm going to make is going to discuss the Huckel rules so we can understand what an aromatic transition state is all about.